Hello, Wayne County Community College students. This is going to be our um, micro class, and I wanted to get started with it as soon as possible. So just remember that your textbook is going to be Tolero. Uh This is going to be the 11th edition of Foundations in Microbiology. Okay, on chapter one, uh, please note that we're going to start with the definition of microbiology, which is a microbiology is a specialized uh, area of biology that deals with tiny uh, life forms that are not readily observable without a microscope. Okay, uh, microorganisms. These are living organisms that are too small to be seen with the naked eye. So we'll, I want you to get a really good grasp on what microbiology entails because a lot of your current events, your current events will be uh, predicated upon you knowing what microbiology is. So I don't get articles that are not microbiologically uh, relevant. So these are the things that microbiology is. It's uh, bacteria, viruses, uh, fungi, protozoans, algae, and helminths, which are parasitic worms. Um, I will also throw in there uh, things with the genome like uh, DNA, RNA, and ATP. You could put that in there too, but for the most part, try to keep your uh, understanding of microbiology to be about bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoans. Um, algae and helminths, things like that. So let's start with uh, thinking of text. Let's just look here. Prokaryotes. Yeah. So prokaryotes are microorganisms that lack a nucleus or carrion. This form of life, um, this is the only form of life that has been around for half of Earth's history. So we'll say the Earth has been around for about 4 billion uh, years. Protozoans have been around for about uh, uh, close to 3.5 billion years. So that's on page 6. You can see the timeline of when the universe was probably first, when it first materialized. And then you can go on all the way to present time, and it shows the origin of Earth. As soon as Earth was created or formed, um, prokaryotes were on the scene. I, when you think about prokaryotes, think of, I would just think of bacteria. So that would be the easiest way. You think about prokaryotes, think about bacteria. Uh, of course, a lot of some other microorganisms as well. But the main thing I want you to know right now is bacteria is considered a prokaryote and it does not have a, they do not have nuclei or don't have a nucleus. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, um, EU, meaning true nucleus, they are organisms that have a nucleus and that would include us. So animals and plants. Uh, are the big category for that. Mold, yeast, they have nuclei, right? Algae, protozoans, uh, worms, etc. They have nuclei. So to all that whole category, including us, are uh, eukaryotes. So when you think about prokaryotes, just think about bacteria. And then that leaves everything else, mostly everything else is uh, eukaryotes. So prokaryotes not only lack a nucleus, but also lack other complex internal uh, compartments known as organelles. So prokaryotes don't have even uh, these other internal components known as organelles. Organelles are cell structures and cells that are bound by one or more membrane. For example, mitochondria or Golgi complex then they perform specific functions in the eukaryotes. Prokaryotes also perform specific functions, but they lack the dedicated organelles. So prokaryotes really are um, they're just like a, a cell without a nucleus, and they don't have complex uh, 
organelles, whereas eukaryotes have a nucleus and they have complex organelles like mitochondria and Golgi bodies or Golgi complex, things like that. All right. So I wanted you to make sure I'm just going to look through this text. I want you to make sure that you look on page seven, take a look at the basic structure of the cells and the viruses and compare the prokaryotic cell and the eukaryotic cell. Uh, very simple in their um, description. And then look at what a virus looks like. We'll talk about viruses more in more detail later. Um, we'll talk about it later. I'm not going to... The other thing is, I'm not going to put viruses in... Uh, I'm not going to talk about viruses too much, but I do want you to know that viruses are not cells. Yeah. They're much more simple. They're just really, in my opinion, they're like uh, protein um, covering a genome, and covering a DNA or an RNA. Just a protein that's covering a DNA or an RNA. That's what a, a virus is. They are genetic material wrapped in protein. And that's, of course, going to depend. It depends definitely on the host cell for all of its uh, activities. Okay. Um, see, so you'll look on, look at the bacteria, look at how it progressed through a timeline. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that, but you should still read over it. Um, I wanted to get into some. Uh, well, let me get into uh, scientific method because I gotta make sure I mention that. Uh, scientific method explains a certain natural phenomenon. Uh, the primary um, aim of this method is to formulate a hypothesis. So the scientific method is really you're going to form a hypothesis, and uh, which a, a hypothesis is a tentative uh, explanation to account for what has been observed or measured. All right. Uh, if that hypothesis can be tested and the results reproduced, and not just that, but a whole lot of other things that come along with that hypothesis, then it becomes a theory. And then the theory is a collection of statements, propositions, or concepts that explains or accounts for the natural event, explains and accounts for that hypothesis. Now, that theory can be scrutinized uh, time and time again, then it can eventually become a law or a principle. So let me go over that. Scientific method develops rational hypotheses. Like a lot of people will say, yeah, that was my uh, theory. No, that was your hypothesis. You first have to have the idea, which is the hypothesis. Then after it's proven, and it can develop after it's been tested. It can develop into a theory. So don't just jump to, that was my theory. No, that was your hypothesis. Then it goes to theory. And then if the theory can be repeated and tested over time and time and time, it can become law or principle. That's the way it goes. So scientific method starts with a hypothesis, a tentative explanation or just a theory, a th I mean, a, a thought, not a theory, a thought, an idea. Then, after it is measured, observed, explained, it can become a theory. The theory is repeated. Uh, uh, the uh, theory is challenged over and over again. It keeps getting the same result. Now it can become a law or a principle. So a theory is not a result of a single experiment that's repeated over and over. No. It's the entire body of ideals that are expressed and explains many aspects of that phenomenon. At some point, um, evidence and accuracy and the predictability of a theory is so compelling that the next level of confidence is reached and that theory becomes a law or a principle. So that is a scientific method that I need you to understand the thought process of having a scientific method from a hypothesis to a theory to a law or a principle. Okay. 
Uh, these guys, these scientists, let's see. So these scientists, you got, uh, what's the main guy's name? Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, right? This is this Dutch linen merchant and a self-made microbiologist. Uh, back in the day, you just make yourself a microbiologist. You don't have to go to school. You just, you know, I guess uh, you had time on your hands. You could just start thinking about a lot of things. So anyway, he constructed over like 250 small, powerful little microscopes that could magnify up to 300 times. And they show a little picture of this uh, microscope that he developed. Um then you have um, this guy named Tyndall, John Tyndall, T-Y-N-D-A-L-L. -L. This was an English physicist that provided the initial evidence that some of the microbes in the dust in the air have a high heat resistance and particularly vigorous treatment is required to destroy them. So you need a lot of heat in some uh, microbes that are in the air to destroy them. Like he just figured it out that it must be something in the air. So that's Tyndall. And then uh, Kahn, C O H N, Ferdinand Kahn. This is a German botanist that clarified the reason that heat would sometimes fail to completely eliminate all micro microorganisms. And he discovered and detailed a description of even heat resistant bacteria, which are known as endospores. Now we're going to learn a lot about endospores, but the two I want you to keep in mind are uh, the bacteria. The two bacteria that uh, create spores or endospores is Clostridium and Bacillus. Clostridium and Bacillus. And that's C-L-O-S-T-R-I-D-I-U-M, Clostridium, and then Bacillus, B A C. I-L-L-U-S would be the bacillus, okay? Those guys, uh, that, that was um, Khan, Ferdinand Khan, who decided, oh yeah, there are some things floating around in the air that you do need uh, heat to kill, but there are some things that heat won't kill, and that would be endospores. And the two uh, bacteria that produce endospores that I need you to understand and know about our clostridium and bacillus. Now, when you do kill everything um, and the is completely free of all life forms, and that includes spores and it's the bacteria, the spores and the viruses, then that's called sterile. There are no life forms um, alive. That is sterile. That's not disinfectant. Sometimes we'll just clean a surface. You still may have some remaining bacteria, maybe 0.1%. That's just a disinfectant. But sterility means there's no life form. And that includes spores and viruses, okay? So now we have Louis Pasteur. Um, he introduced the microbiological techniques that are still in use today. He's considered the father of microbiology. Uh, he used fermentation and the microbiological microbial role in wine and beer formation by uh, using fermentation. He invented pasteurization, pasteurization, which of course is uh, and completed some of the first studies showing that human diseases could arise from infection. So he did a lot with bacteria. And uh, pasteurization was one thing that was pretty important because, you know, you, you, you're getting your milk from a cow and there could be a lot of bacteria on the udders that you're squeezing to get the milk. Um, and so you drink that and then you end up sick. So if you just go and heat this milk to a certain temperature and kill the bacteria, that, that's what pasteurization is, then you don't get sick. Um, I've had people in my class that are totally against pasteurization and they just drink unpasteurized milk. That's a thing now, I guess. Um, that's up to you. But I will caution um, I will caution against it and definitely don't give that to your children. Quite frankly, I wouldn't even drink cow's milk because cow's milk is for calves. 
Um, there are alternatives now, and you could drink plant-based milk and be just that's fine. Cow's milk is for cows. Baby cows are called calves. All right. And usually adults and other adult animals don't even drink milk because that is the food for babies, right? But humans do whatever they want to. Uh, so then we have the other guy, Koch, Robert Koch, K-O-C-H. He's from Germany, was from Germany. He introduced uh, Koch's postulates, and that was a series of proofs that verified the germ theory. Remember, um, Louis Pasteur was like, hey, I think people are getting sick from some kind of infection. But, you know, you can't, you're just thinking of these things. Like I said, that's their hypotheses. But then they have to go on and prove it time and time again. And, of course, it becomes a theory. So they're, like, figuring this stuff out. I'm just going through the history so that you can understand that microbiology didn't just fall out of a tree. I mean, people had to think of this stuff. And then they had to prove this stuff. And then it had to be proven over and over. You know, it, when, we're not talking about fake news. <laughs> We're talking about things that are science, and that's what I base um, my entire, uh, you know, philosophy on. As my philosophy is heavily, heavily science-based, and how I conduct my life is basically science-based. So anyway, Koch, K-O-C-H, Robert Koch, introduced Koch's postulates, a series of proofs that verified the germ theory and could establish whether an organism um, was pathogenic and which disease it caused. So he could decide, oh, this organism is pathogenic. Pathogenic means disease-causing. And now, what disease does it cause? He established a pathogen disease link. So, hey, we got something that can cause, seems to cause a problem, and it does. Now you end up with a disease, so that is a pathogen disease link. And he provided the bacteria Bacillus anthrax, and that causes anthrax. So we talked about Bacillus before, do you remember? It was one of the two that I explained to you have uh, spores, endospores. And they're highly, highly heat resistant. Endospores are highly, highly chemical resistant. Endospores are. And endospores, uh, in addition to that, will last for centuries. We have spores that have been around since biblical times. So spores are really, they can go into a dormant state if they think the environment is going to be harsh or, or conditions are harsh and it's going to kill them. This bacteria will be like, oh, nope, I'm going to get dormant. I'm going to make myself into a spore and I'm going to just hang in there until conditions get right and then I'll Become a get become into a vegetative state, and then um, that makes this the bacteria much more vulnerable. You can kill it then when it's in a vegetative state, but in a spore state, that is not going to be very easy to kill. Actually, when things are in spore state, the Clostridium or the Bacillus, that's when we use steam, and that's called autoclave. I think it, if I recall. I think it's like 121 degrees Celsius for like 20 minutes. So, and we've seen that. Like we would be like cleaning the uh, the uh, surgical equipment. And be like, oh no, it's all cleaned up. And people were still dying, getting disease. They're like something else is on, is on these uh, uh, instruments. So we need to do something more. So that's how this whole idea of autoclave and steam. If you've ever been burned by steam, you know it, it really does. Uh, hurt a lot. Also, so anyway, that's Koch, Pasture, and those other guys I mentioned. Let me see if this one guy I really like is um, I don't know uh, Lister L I S T E R. I just saw him in the book. He was an English surgeon. Um, he took notice of these of uh, some observations, and he decided to introduce the aseptic technique. That is a staining technique that I will be introducing to you and that was aimed at reducing microbes in the medical setting to prevent wound infection. Uh, the concept of asepsis meaning without, a meaning without, 
sepsis, a sepsis, a septic technique, um, really was something that helped with like disinfecting uh, the instruments, our hands, our area, the tables, everything. And that's what we use today for when we go into surgery, etc. Um, you know, it, it says here in your text, it's hard to, for us to believe, but as recently as the late 1800s, surgeons wore street clothes in the operating room and had little idea that hand washing was important. Well, today, of course, we've been under this whole guise of uh, COVID-19, this little um, <laughs> virus. And so now we are becoming much more aware of hand washing and keeping your hands off of your face and um, because you don't want the virus or any pathogens getting into a mucosal membrane like your eyes, your nose, or your mouth. So if you keep your hands off your face, that would reduce, significantly reduce the, the chances of transmission. So another guy I wanted to introduce, let me see if he is here. Apparently I didn't write these things in order. So anyway, I, I, I know him, but I'll, his name is uh, Simmelweis. S-E-M-M-E-L-W-E-I-S. Uh, Ignaz, I-G-N-A-Z. This guy is a doc, was a doctor, and uh, he noticed that women in the maternity wards were, and their babies were getting sick and had a high mor mor morbidity, high death rate. Crazy as it was, the doctors would leave an autopsy. They cutting up disease bodies, people have died, and they're doing an autopsy. And then, oh, Mrs. So and so is in labor. He would drop those instruments, or maybe carry those same instruments with him. I don't know. But then he'd go and deliver the baby. Now he didn't wash his hands. He didn't change clothes. He didn't have on a gown or anything that, or or a lab jacket that he took off. No. He goes straight in, delivers the baby, and the baby gets the disease that the that the uh, the corpse had, and the mother gets it too. So they're like, "Wait, what? How? What is going on? All these women and these babies are dying. Women that were delivered and cared for at home, they could see that the midwives weren't doing autopsies. Those women had a higher chance of living if you delivered at home, because the midwives weren't." rushing in from some diseased body doing an autopsy. And they, this guy, uh, Semmelweis, uh, actually figured that out. He just did it through observation. So that was a great hypothesis. And over time, as he tried to prove it and try to tell the doctors they were very, very snobby and arrogant, hey, you need to wash your hands, you need to change your clothes, you need to, they rejected him time and time again. This is in history. They rejected his ideas. And um, they kicked him out of the academies. He, he, you know, they just really didn't want to uh, pay attention to what he was saying. And they just, you know, kept going old school. So Semmelweis ended up uh, just being uh, booted out of everything and uh, I think he went crazy. <laughs> they put him in some kind of uh, asylum and he went crazy. But of course now we know you should wash your hands, you should change your clothes, you sh shouldn't leave an autopsy and go and deliver a baby. You shouldn't leave an autopsy and go anywhere except for somewhere to change your clothes and wash your hands and scrub. All right, let's look at nomenclature. Nomenclature is on page 19. Nomenclature is a system of assigning names to various uh, uh, rankings of micro, microbial species. Um, this is how we identify them. Uh, taxonomy is a formal system for organizing, classifying, and naming living things. Uh, primarily uh, concerns of taxonomy are classification, nomenclature, and identif identification. These three areas are interactive interrelated and they play a vital role. So classification, nomenclature, and taxonomy. Say that again. Classification, nomenclature, and identification 
are the three formal types of uh, classifying things and naming things. And that whole category is called taxonomy. Of course, it plays a vital role in keeping a dynamic inventory of, ex of the extensive array of living things. So I'm saying it's dynamic. In other words, we may put something in a category one day, but then we learn more about that organism. And then that is going to change it from being in that particular category. Okay, so it's not stagnant. It's not static. It's dynamic. Things can move in and out of categories. It's just going to depend on how much we learn about that particular organism. So um, I want you to know the domain, all which is the highest, biggest group. That's a giant group. The domain is all-inclusive category. Only one or a few general characteristics are shared. Very general, but going all the way down, descending ranks of hierarchy, go all the way down to species. Species is the most specific group, essentially the same kind of organism that shares the majority of the characteristics. So the domain is just very general. You may have one or two characteristics, but down to species, um, uh, you're going to be very specific about what you, and it's a much smaller group. So the order of taxonomy would be domain, and so we're going to go domain, big, huge group, kingdom, lesser of a huge group, phylum, division, class, order, family, species, family, genus, species, okay? Domain, kingdom, phylum, division, class, order, family, genus, species. You must know it in that order. Four of them I'm going to want you to know for sure will be kingdom, phylum, genus, and species. Those four. Kingdom, phylum, genus, and species. Those are the four I'm going to be much more concerned with, but you still need to know the order. Um, I want you to remember that they are not permanent. They are constantly being revised and refined as new information becomes available. Right? Um, I want you to know... Uh, how things should be written because you have to know the scientific name of your bacteria, your, your I'll just say your microorganism because it could be a virus too. Should be written specifically with a capitalized genus. The genus should be capitalized and a lowercase species. And it must be either underlined or, or that's a big or, or italicized. In other words, um, I need you to practice writing things like, let's say, Staphylococcus aureus. That is a bacteria. So the S in Staphylococcus would be capitalized because it is the genus. The A in aureus would be lowercase because it is the species, but they would be underlined. Or they could be italicized if you have a computer, you could italicize them. But usually in your writing, you will just underline them. Suppose you had something like Campylobacter jejuni, really bad GI disease. Campylobacter, the C in Campylobacter will be capitalized because it is the genus. The J in jejuni is going to be lowercase because it is the species. Both will be underlined if you're writing it. Or even if you're typing it, you can underline it. But also the other option with when you're typing it, you can italicize it. And then you do not underline it if you, if you italicize. So it's either going to, the genus of species will be either underlined after you write the genus and the species, or the genus and the species will be italicized. All right. In your book on page 19, uh, I think it's talking about histoplasma capsulatum, and it will show you that uh, histoplasma capsulatum can be italicized or underlined. The genus, which is histoplasma, is capitalized, and capsulatum is the genus, it's the species, so it is lowercase. Where is this? Can you see it here? 
All right. And sometimes you can even just put H cap, uh, capsulinum. So you can just put an H in a period. So you don't have to write the entire word, but they must be either underlined or capitalized though. All right, so that is the scientific naming or scientific name. Every time you write something or turn something into me, it should be written that way. Um, if it's not, I'll be taking off points. We got five major kingdoms, five major kingdoms. Uh, Monera, fungi, protes, plants, and animals. Early on, we thought they were just plants and animals, um, plant and animal kingdoms, but later on we learned or we evolved to knowing that there are more um, than just plants and animals in the kingdoms, right? So that is really, um, let's see if there's anything else. That's really chapter one. That's just giving you an introduction. I want you to look at pictures of the, uh, the on page 22, you can see eukaryotes and the prokaryotes in this big old, like a tree of where we first started and how we grew up and became all these different other things, uh, these plants, these animals, uh, proteins. So you'll see where the monarians start as prokaryotes and then how prokaryotes evolved and became eukaryotes. That's the theory that they're working on now. And I will say that's a theory because um, they have some proof that seems to hold the test of time, but it hasn't been a law yet. Um, I want you to know about the measurements, mac measurements, macroscopic, meaning you can see it with the naked eye, will be measured in meters and centimeters, but microorganisms, so macroscopic organisms, organisms you can see with the naked eye, they'll be measured in meters or centimeters. Microscopic organisms, ones that you need a microscope for, which you will not see with the naked eye, will be measured in micrometers, uh, nanometers, and millimeters. So micrometers looks like a little U and an M. That's a micrometer. Millimeters is M, M. And nanometer is an N and an M. Okay? So you will know that. And when you look... And here you will see that uh, that viruses um, are really, really small. And we didn't really know about viruses until um, electron. We knew that it was something else other than bacteria. Let's just put it that way. That was causing problems. But we're like, well, what is it? So an electron microscope was developed. Now, then you can see viruses. Now, maybe something else just have to get the technology and a different kind of microscope to figure it out. But viruses range from one nanometer, that's the NM, to 200 nanometers, okay? Uh, on the other hand, bacteria can be pretty large. Uh, they measure from one micrometer to 100 micrometers. And you could view those with a regular microscope. But for viruses, they're so small, you need an electron microscope because they're in nanometers, whereas bacteria are in micrometers, okay? With the little U, M, micrometers. So I just wanted to give that introduction of chapter one. Uh, I'm still waiting for my technician to get herself together so that uh, we can get these videos up and rolling, rolling. But for right now, that's a good overview of chapter one. Always uh, look at the pictures, read the captions under the pictures. I get a lot of test questions from those. Uh, read anything that's in bold and uh, 
or italicized. And they have, uh, just so you'll know, in the back of the book, it gives a good summary and some critical thinking questions and other questions. So feel free to go through that. That's, it's your textbook. You purchased it, so use the textbook. I think that's about it. Have any questions, we can uh, discuss it during office hours. All right. I'll see you next time for Chapter 2. I Chapter 2 is going to be more like chemistry. So I'm going to need my whiteboard, and I'm definitely going to need some assistance with uh, filming. But right now, until I get some help, I'll be doing it this way. All right. Thanks. I'll see you later when we go into Chapter 2, which is the chemistry of biology. We're not going into real deep, but I have to give you an overview so that as we discuss things uh, more in the term, you will understand what I'm talking about. So we, I have to introduce it. All right. With that in mind, I'll see you next time uh, when we do Chapter 2. All right. Bye-bye.